Hello everybody and welcome to the video lecture on the immune system worksheet, part two. Here we'll be focusing on the function of the immune system, applying what we learned about the different kinds of cell types in the immune system, and seeing how they all work together to help defend our body against foreign pathogens and antigens. So before we get going with this worksheet, I want to do a couple things, and one of them was to just brainstorm which of the which of the following things that you see on this page could be considered a foreign threat to your body. So I'm going to show you all the options here. We got E. coli, anthrax, a virus, cat, cancer cell, tapeworm, a parasite, broccoli, a fungus, and pollution. So which, if any, of these is, do you think, could be a foreign threat? So when I ask this question in class, a lot of people will um, say that maybe everything, maybe except for broccoli, other people say maybe everything except for maybe the cat and the broccoli, and there's another usually group of people who feel like pollution, broccoli, and cat, like these three on the right, don't seem to be foreign threats as much. Uh, and then there's a group of people who say all of it is possibly a foreign threat to the body. And guess what? All of it is. All of it could be a potential threat um, to humans. Um, the ones that are less obvious, okay, so cat, well, some people have allergies to cats. And so an allergic reaction is a response to a foreign threat, according to your body. Um, some people have allergies to pollutants in the air, so pollution can lead to allergy attacks, so that would count as a foreign threat. And then broccoli, probably the one that people least suspect, because we don't hear a lot about broccoli allergies, right? But the reality is that we don't sanitize our food. That broccoli has bacteria on it, it has viruses on it, it could have fungi on it. Um, so because we don't sanitize our food, when you're eating broccoli, you're also eating other types of microorganisms or germs. So today when we're going through the worksheet, we're going to be mostly focusing on bacteria. So something like E. coli, for example, we're going to see how the immune system will react to bacterial infection. All right, so if you don't have this worksheet already, please go to Canvas and download and print it out so that you can follow along. It's not necessarily required, but it's recommended that you do that. And then I also recommend that you have a sheet of maybe binder paper or scratch paper, something that you can write notes on on the side because there's not a lot of room to write notes on this worksheet directly. All right, so um, let's see, we got the goals. So there's gonna be two parts to the immune response. And the two parts are designated by these two different boxes here. And in general, what we're gonna be talking about, like I said, is we're focusing on a bacterial infection. And we're going to pretend that you stepped on a nail, right? So there's the, the nail going into the foot. And so this little pocket here is gonna be the surface of your skin and here's the, the cut that the nail made into your skin. And we're gonna pretend that bacteria penetrated into your skin because there was bacteria on the nail. And how is your immune system in the first part gonna handle the bacteria on the nail? And how is your immune system going to handle the infection um, from the nail? How is it going to handle that infection in the second part of your immune response? So first of all, let's name the different parts of the immune response. On the left-hand side, we're going to be talking about something called the... I'm going to use a darker pen here. So 
So this is going to be called the innate. Some people call it the non-specific defenses. And these innate defenses are going to be occurring in the first zero to four hours that the infection is taking place. In general, we're going to see that the bacteria penetrates into the skin. There's going to be response from this first cell type here called the dendritic cell. And then we're also going to see a bunch of cells coming from this capillary here. So by the way, that's what, so that's what that is. Maybe label it. So we have a capillary here. You can see uh, it's lined by these endothelial cells. The dots are the nuclei. So we'll have a bunch of cells coming from the capillary migrating into the dermis. And then the dendritic cell is going to travel through lymphatic vessels, eventually getting to the lymph node. And you have lots of lymph nodes in your body, but we're just going to show one. And it is traveling, to get to the lymph node, it has to travel through afferent lymphatic vessels. There's usually multiple afferent lymphatic vessels that can get to a single lymph node. And then a whole bunch of stuff is going to happen inside of this lymph node, including activation of other immune cells of the body, like T cells uh, and B cells. And by the end, we're going to get a production of antibodies. We're also going to get production of memory B cells so that you have a, a faster secondary response to the infection if it ever happens later in life. And we're also going to develop some cytotoxic T cells, which will help kill any infected cells in your body. All those things that get produced the antibodies, the memory B cells, the cytotoxic T cells will all be exiting out this efferent lymphatic vessel. And that will take it to um, different fluids of your body like the blood, uh, lymph, and interstitial fluid. So this layer here is going to represent the epidermis the surface of your skin. The layer underneath that, so the deeper layer of the skin here, is called the dermis. And so we're really going to be uh, imagining here that the nail stabbed through the epidermis and that the nail penetrated into the dermal layer of your skin. All right, uh, and last kind of general orientation thing here. So if the innate defenses are this first box, what is the second box displaying? The second box is called your adaptive defenses. Some people call it the specific defenses. And this response happens between the uh, four hour and 96 hour mark after infection. So in general, this first box is this area on the foot. So that first box that dotted box right there, that's this first box. And then the second dotted box is the, is the first lymph node. So that's going to be what we're zooming in on in the second box here. All right, now we've got to go over some general terms because they can get kind of confusing. So we're going to talk about the difference between a pathogen 
an antigen, and an antibody. So let's go ahead and draw a bacterial cell. I'm going to make it kind of oval. Um, in this worksheet, I'm going to I'm going to color anything that's bacterial or of origin of the bacteria. Everything's going to be in red related to bacteria. Um, and on the surface of the bacteria, we have different proteins maybe found on the surface, and they'll have different shapes. Doesn't really matter what shape you draw, as long as there are different shapes. <clears throat> and so, let's start off with defining the word pathogen. So a pathogen is any disease causing or otherwise harmful microorganism. So some examples uh, that are common include bacteria, like we drew here, um, includes like viruses, could be a uh, like fungus or fungi plural, protozoa, worms, and there's more things, but those are some maybe more common ones. So they have to be a microorganism. So they sort of like function uh, to cause a disease or harm your body in some way. And all pathogens have, or almost all pathogens, have antigens associated with them. So the three things that we drew here on the surface of this bacterial cell are different kinds of antigens. The word antigen was made because antigens are antibody generators. So antibody generators, so they called it antigens. So they're essentially um, any molecule, although the most common molecule is going to be proteins, but they're essentially any molecule that stimulates antibody production when detected by another organism. So sort of an important point here is that to the bacterial cell, it's not a foreign antigen. To the bacterial cell, it's normal to have those, um, say, let's say proteins on the surface of its cell. So, you know, to the bacteria, it's like a self antigen. It's something that won't produce an antibody uh, reaction. Um, but to humans, this is foreign. So sometimes we'll call it a foreign antigen. The last term that I want to describe before really getting into the main part of the worksheet is the term antibody. Or antibodies, plural. And these are protein complexes. So there are multiple uh, protein 
multiple polymers of proteins kind of coming together to form a larger protein complex. And they're produced by plasma cells. And these antibodies are going to be binding. They bind a specific antigen. to block that antigen from harming the body. One antibody is going to be specific to only one antigen, generally speaking. And so in our drawing that we have over here on the left, we have three different shapes of antigens here to indicate that you know one pathogen can have many kinds of antigens on it or associated with it. And so maybe for this antigen here, the one more oval, I don't know, more circular shaped, there's an antibody that specifically binds to that one. For the triangular shaped one, there's a different kind of antibody. I'm not going to draw it too different, um, but uh, let's say it's a different one that binds to the triangle antigen. And then for this more blocky antigen, there's another kind of antibody. So these would all be unique antibodies uh, for each unique antigen. And we'll go into more detail about ha how antibodies work towards the very end of this worksheet. All right, so let's get started with the main stuff here. <clears throat> All right, so we're gonna break this down into a series of steps. We're gonna have 15 steps total in the immune response. And so in the first step, which is going to be part of our innate defenses here. The first step is going to be occurring on your epidermis or on the surface of your body. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit there. Cool. And so, um, of course, the nail has penetrated our foot, so we're going to have bacteria kind of scattered on the surface of the body, and some of the bacteria have, you know, gotten inside of the skin, so we can kind of just draw. some bacteria crawling around in the skin there. Let's see, maybe even some of the bacteria start to emit toxins and things like that. So we can draw little dots around them, show that they're emitting toxins, which by the way, Toxins like endotoxin from bacteria also count as antigens. So maybe that's something that we should even add to our notes down here, if you want. So antigens, they don't always have to be attached to the surface of a pathogen. They can also be free floating free-floating toxins uh, like endotoxins, which are toxins from bacteria, um, even venom from like snakes or spiders. Venom also counts as an antigen. Um, even things that are free-floating in the air like allergens, say pollen 
maybe pollution. So not only do we have the surface of the bacterial cells as having proteins, perhaps, that are antigens, but we also have antigens being released by the, protein, by the bacterial cells because they're releasing endotoxins. All right, cool. So that nail brought in that nasty bacteria. Um, but in our step one here, essentially what had to happen is the bacteria had to bypass our first line of defense. So this is our step one, pathogen bypasses the first line of defense. So this is what our, the name of the step is in blue. And in black ink, I've written some notes about what's happening or what normally happens in this step. So normally your epithelia, surface of your skin, or epithelia other in other parts of your body, like in your mouth, are going to act as a physical barrier and also not only a physical barrier, but a hostile surface to foreign invaders, to pathogens. Epithelia can become hostile to foreign pathogens because um, maybe some parts of your body, some epithelia produce mucus, like in your throat, that epithelia produces mucus. Um, or brings it up even from the trachea, etc. Uh, in the lining of your gut, there's mucus. Also, we have bacteria naturally found on the surface of our skin, which we call mutualistic bacteria. And these bacteria help us fight off these other bacterial cells. So bacteria actually are capable of producing their own antibiotics. And those antibiotics can help kill bacteria that you don't want on your body. In addition, our skin has a low pH, so it's more acidic. And due to that acidity on our skin, that helps prevent certain bacteria from growing there. If we think about the epithelia in our eyes, we got tears coating the sur surface of our eyes at all times. There's always some liquid on the eyeball. And in that liquid, you have salt, and the salt can help inhibit growth of bacteria. And in tears, you also have certain enzymes like lysozyme. And that lysozyme enzyme can rip apart bacteria on the surface of your eye. So that kills bacteria. And then say on other parts of your body, other epithelia, you got secretions of things like defensins. Defensins are proteins that poke holes in cells like bacterial cells. And when you poke holes into cells, then the cells start to leak out fluid and then they'll eventually dry out and die. So, that's happening in step one a little bit, but the nail, remember, the nail penetrated the first line of defense. So the bacteria are now past that physical barrier and they're past that normally hostile surface of your body. So this is gonna bring us to step two, which is gonna be indicated by this arrow here. We're going to have a dendritic cell, which we'll call here, we will call it here a resident dendritic cell. A resident dendritic cell because it's living in your skin. So this resident dendritic cell is going to phagocytize the bacteria here, and it's going to then present an antigen through uh, specific mechanisms, which we'll talk about now. So, this step, this is what it's called, resident dendritic cell phagocytosis and antigen presentation. And so let's go through this 
phagocytosis and antigen presentation one step at a time. So first of all, the, 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 the dendritic cell here, we're drawing it a little bit bigger so we can see what's going on. So here's our dendritic cell. There's the bacterial cell that it's encountering. So the dendritic cell is going to recognize the pathogen via a receptor that it has on here called a toll-like receptor, or TLR. Toll-like receptor. So, toll-like. I did not draw the toll-like receptor here, but it's, it's there somewhere. Um, it may not be able to recognize the pathogen every time because sometimes pathogens have something called a capsule around them, some sort of like shell, and that shell helps prevent them from being detected by the immune system. But in this case, we're gonna pretend that the bacterial cell doesn't have a capsule. Next, what's going to happen in that dendritic cell is it's going to undergo phagocytosis, which is kind of like endocytosis, except a little different because it's a much larger um, thing that it's engulfing, and it's also going to be breaking it down. So because it's breaking it down, we're going to call it phagocytosis. Um, so here we see the bacterial cell trapped in a little vesicle there. And it's not shown here, but that vesicle is going to fuse with an organelle called the lysosome. And the lysosome provides that acidity, the enzymes to break everything down in here. So remember, the bacterial cell has a bunch of antigens on it, right? So we're breaking this bacterial cell down into a bunch of different little antigens. These are the little dots representing the little pieces of the bacteria, all the little antigens that it's composed of. And then it's going to fuse another vesicle with this vesicle. And this vesicle contains a unique cell protein called MHC class 2. And we'll talk a little bit about that in the, in the last step here. This protein, MHC class 2, is going to end up inside of that vesicle with all the antigens, and it's going to be taking it to the other, to some surface of the cell. Um, another main point here is that dendritic cells, according to our uh, family tree worksheet of immune system cells that we did already, <clears throat> um, dendritic cells are professional phagocytes. So it's doing this phagocytosis professionally, and dendritic cells are also professional antigen-presenting cells. So by the end of this process, the, the end result is the dendritic cell is going to be presenting a little piece of that bacteria, a little antigen from it, on the surface of its cell, and it's attaching it to an MHC class 1 protein. So all of that is happening in this part here. So here it is uh, meeting up with the bacterial cell, it's gonna it's gonna detect it through those toll-like receptors, and then eventually it's gonna end up. And it's really hard to draw in detail this part, so I'm just gonna do a little bit of green, showing the MHC class two protein, and I'll just draw a little tiny red dot there to show that it's carrying a little antigen from the bacteria. And we might as well just 
quickly add that to the other, to this dendritic cells that's migrating. That shows that completely. Let's see. Oh, so something interesting about this step too is that because the dendritic cell recognizes the bacterial cell through the toll-like receptors, it actually is specific, which is odd because we call everything happening here the nonspecific defenses. So as it turns out, it was thought to be not specific, non-specific, um, before the 1980s. But uh, in the 1980s, they discovered these toll-like receptors and realized, hey, guess what? It actually is a specific connection between our immune system cells and the pathogens. So it's actually more specific than we thought. So they changed the name to innate defenses. So for me, I like innate defenses much more than non-specific defenses, since it actually is specific. All right, so in some cases, um, like I mentioned before, maybe this bacterial cell has some sort of coating around it, like a capsule, and it's not detected by the dendritic cells. Um, maybe it's not detected, so we have a backup for this. So we're also gonna have another cell type in here, not shown, called a resident macrophage. And the resident macrophage can do all the same stuff that we just talked about the dendritic cell doing. Let's go ahead and draw it. So, So let's just show it here, capturing some bacterial cell. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> okay, there we go. This step. We call this step resident macrophage phagocytosis and antigen presentation. So this is the same as the previous step, except it's a different cell. Essentially, it's just going to act like a backup cell, just in case the dendritic cell wasn't able to correctly bind to the pathogen. So we can add a little step three there to remind us that that step is happening. Step four is going to happen with another cell that's not shown here. I'll put it in this corner. The cell has a little bit more ruffled border to it. Let's draw its nucleus right there. This cell releases molecules like histamines and cytokines. I'm gonna draw this release of histamines and cytokines as dotted lines here. This cell is our, is our mast cell. So for this step, I'm going to call it mast cells secrete histamines and cytokines. The histamines are going to play the role of vasodilation. They're going to cause your capillaries to dilate so that they become more leaky. 
any of those spaces between the endothelial cells are going to expand and make it easier for immune system cells that are trapped in the capillary to actually leak out of the capillary into the infected tissue area. The cytokines released by the mast cells are going to attract and activate immune system cells. So you need both of these in order to actually get the immune system cells from the blood into the infected tissue area. You need to open the door for them, right? Then you need to attract them through the door between those endothelial cells, and then you need to activate them so that they function properly. These two things are going to result in inflammation. And four things that come with inflammation are swelling, heat, redness, and pain. Maybe take a moment here and pause the video to think of why, why does swelling take place? Why does redness take place? Why does heat increase in, the, in, a, in a place that an infection is happening? And why is there more pain associated with that? So maybe brainstorm on your own for a moment and then come back to the video. So let's think of swelling first. So there's gonna be things coming from the blood into the tissue area. So you're getting more things into the tissue. It's gonna swell the tissue up with cells and with fluids. There's also going to be more heat associated with the inf infection area because by vasodilating, then those blood vessels are getting wider and bringing more blood into the area. And blood is really warm. So you can feel that extra warmth through the extra blood delivery. Blood also is red, so it's going to increase the visibility of the redness from the blood. And then for pain, the swelling actually results in the pain that we feel in an, an infection area because swelling pushes on the nerves in this infected area. And when the nerves get pushed on, they could send pain signals to your brain. All right, so Let's go to step five. Um, all right, um, actually before step five, let's just draw all the different kinds of immune system cells that we might find in our capillary bed here. So, let's draw this one first. So there's a nucleus that has a little bump on it right there. It has also some granules. I wonder if anybody can, if anybody knows what kind of cell that is just by looking at it. All right, we'll, we'll break it down in a bit. So another one. The cell's going to look like that has that um, bilobed nucleus. Another immune system cell here has a multi-lobed nucleus. Another one has a sort of U-shaped nucleus. And the last one some granules in there. Alright, so for our step five, we're gonna have these two cells
leaving the capillary bed and entering the infected tissue area. So maybe you guessed it already. So these cells, let's do this, are basophils and eosinophils. So the basophil is that first one, and what it's going to do is once it enters a tissue, it's going to release more histamines. The eosinophil is going to be more involved in allergic reactions and parasitic invasions. So when there's a parasite involved or if it's an allergy attack thing, then uh, eosinophils are usually there, but um, maybe for this bacterial infection, they're not going to leave the capillary bed, but just for so you guys have information about it, let's draw it leaving the capillary bed. So of course the basophil is going to make even more um, inflammation happen because of those histamines. Um, and so something I wanted to show here was specifically about the eosinophils. Oh, oops, I guess I... Basically, you've seen the film. Okay, so the... Let's go along here. So let's say there was a parasite, and let's say it's a parasitic uh, fluke worm. So like a little small parasite there. But it's actually pretty large compared to the eosinophils. So the eosinophils are going to not be able to um, do phagocytosis. Why? Because they're way too small compared to that parasite. So how do they actually take, how do they handle the parasite if they can't phagocytize it? They are going to release lytic enzymes, enzymes that will cause the lysis of the cells in the parasite. All right. That's step six. So step six, we're going to have this cell type here called the neutrophil. And the neutrophil is going to migrate out of the capillary. And the neutrophil is really good at phagocytosis. It's a professional phagocyte. So it's going to help gobble up and destroy pathogens in that location. Okay, step seven is going to be related to this cell here. That's going to be our monocytes. All right, so step seven, monocyte migration, migration out of the capillary bed. Then monocytes are going to undergo cellular differentiation to turn into two different cell types. And then once they've differentiated, they're going to uh, do phagocytosis to help the neutrophils out. Those monocytes can differentiate into dendritic cells or macrophages. And when they do that, they may become resident dendritic cells or resident macrophages like we dealt with in uh, steps two and three. So they just bulk up the support in that uh, tissue of your skin. All right, so 
Now things here, here are gonna get a little bit more complicated. In step eight, we have this cell leaving. And entering this tissue. So this cell is called the natural killer cell. So in this step, I'm gonna I like to call it natural killer cells, lice compromised, non-professional antigen presenting cells. So this one's a little bit more complicated, so we're going to have to talk about different kinds of proteins found on cells. So there's two different MHC protein complexes. There's MHC class 2, which we've looked at um, on the dendritic cell already, or on the macrophage, those cells that are professional antigen-presenting cells. And then there's MHC class 1. We're going to have MHC class 1 look like this. The purpose of MHC class 2 is to communicate what foreign material was found. So if we think about what happened in uh, step 2, the dendritic cell was using MHC class 2 and then putting the, a little piece of that bacteria antigen on the surface of it, it was communicating, or it's trying to communicate with cells around it, what foreign material it found. It's like, hey, check this out. I found a little piece of bacteria floating around, um, or hey, I gobbled up this bacteria and I destroyed it, and here's a little bit of what it looked like. So it's found in professional antigen-presenting cells. In contrast, this MHC class 2 protein, it's not about communicating what a cell found, it's about displaying proof of the cell's health. So it's going to help communicate whether a cell is healthy, whether a cell is infected or sick. And these MHC class 1 Proteins are found on all cells, including professional antigen-presenting cells. The only kind of cell in your body that's really excluded from having MHC class 1 proteins are your red blood cells. So let's take a look at a couple of examples of this. So for this, we're going to zoom into that here. So let's say here is our natural killer cell, and it has three different cells that it is scanning. Remember, natural killer cells, they are by default designed to kill any cell in your body by default. But your the cells of your body have to prove that they are healthy in order to not be killed by the natural killer cell. So let's take this first example here. Natural killer cell is interacting with this cell. This cell has an MHC class 1 protein. There it is in purple. And on the surface of MHC class 1, it's displaying a self antigen. So it's an antigen that is normal to find in the person's body. It's of the, cell, the person's self. It's not foreign. When the natural killer cell scans the cell, it sees, okay, that's healthy. No foreign antigen um, on MHC class 1, then that's great. It's going to leave it alone, so no cell lysis in this case. Sometimes when cells of your body get infected by things like viruses, then the cell will actually take away its MHC class 1 and by taking away the MHC class 1, then the natural killer cell sees this and it's like, hey, you're not, you're not telling me whether you're healthy or not. And so by default, because it's not telling the natural killer cell its health, 
then the natural killer cell is going to make that cell die. It's going to cause lysis in the cell, which is actually great because a lot of times when cells are missing this protein complex, it means that they're infected by something. So it kills that cell, killing the virus with it. In this third example, this cell recognized that it was infected by a virus. And instead, in this case, it's, it found a part of the virus. So it took a little piece of the anti a little piece of the virus, a little antigen, and then it's displaying it on MHC class one. But this is different than how a professional antigen presenting cell does it, because this cell didn't go out and find the pathogen and break it down and you know destroy it and then show a little piece of it. It was more of a victim. This cell was a victim and it got infected and it just so happened to be able to take a little piece of that virus and then display it on the surface, letting know, letting the immune system know, hey, I'm sick right now, I'm infected, you should kill me. So there it is, the natural killer cell sees the non-self antigen and then causes the lysis of that cell. So, um, all right, yep, there we go. I think that's enough there. So in step eight, we're not drawing any of the other cells that it might be interacting with because uh, it's too much going on already. But in that step eight, keep in mind, there might be some cells in the dermis or maybe cells in the epidermis that are compromised and it can help kill those things. All right, so now to step nine. So step nine is gonna be that part. And in step nine, So we call this dendritic cell migration to a lymph node. This step nine takes about 24 hours in order for it to totally travel to the lymph node to completely get there. Um, but the first step of it is that the dendritic cell has to get through the walls of the lymphatic capillary. That's fairly quick, but then it has to go through all these lymphatic vessels to eventually get to a lymph node. So the whole process takes about 24 hours. And this is going to be a vital link between the innate defenses on the left of the worksheet and the adaptive defenses on the right of the worksheet. And just as a note, we're showing a dendritic cell doing this, but it could be a macrophage that is doing this if in step three, the macrophage captured the bacteria and displayed the antigen via MHC class two, then it could very well be the thing traveling through here. And then last step of the innate defenses is step 10. So in step 10, we'll call this step local inflammation increases the pressure of the interstitial fluid. So all the fluid found in this tissue here, which we don't really see, but lots of water um, dissolved things in the fluid. So all this fluid is getting in higher, is pressurized because of the inflammation due to all the histamines and the migration of all of these immune system cells. So all that inflammation is going to put pressure against this lymphatic capillary here. 
and that's going to push things into the lymphatic capillary, including any little antigens that those bacteria are producing. So maybe that bacteria here is producing endotoxin. Some of those endotoxins are going to get shoved into the lymphatic capillary and flow through the lymphatic vessels, eventually entering the lymph node. A more concrete example is for strep bacteria. So the bacteria involved in strep throat, they emit an antigen called M protein. And the reason why those strep bacteria will release M protein is because M protein is really effective at blocking phagocytosis. So strep bacteria often circumvent or block phagocytosis by dendrocytes uh, by sorry, by uh, dendritic cells, and they'll block phagocytosis from macrophages for a little while. Um, and that M protein, so M protein all over here, will eventually get into the lymphatic vessels and trigger uh, an immune response in the lymph nodes, which will thankfully eventually produce antibodies that will allow us to fight off the infection. But initially, they are doing it because it's adv advantageous to them. So anyway, this bacteria is not strep, but something else. It's releasing some other type of toxin that is helpful to them in the short term, but it's leaking into our immune system, into our lymphatic system here. And that's going to help the adaptive defenses start off. So let's see, I got a new, new page here. So step 11 is going to be when a cell in your lymph node detects those free floating antigens. This cell that will detect, hopefully, those antigens is called a naive B cell. So for this step 11, we're going to call this naive B cell endocytosis and antigen presentation. So sort of a general idea of what's happening here is that large quantities of antigens are entering the lymph node and they're bumping into billions of unique B cells. We're just drawing one, but there's billions of them and there's only gonna be one of those naive B cells that is sensitive to that particular antigen. Now, having a billion unique B cells is great because that means we can detect a billion different antigens in the environment. And in our lifetime, we're not gonna even encounter a billion antigens. Um, so it's possible that there's a naive B cells that don't ever detect anything um, in your lymph node. But in this case, we're saying this is the lucky guy, it's being sensitive to that particular antigen. So let's take a look at what happens. So three steps. So starting off with our naive B cell, the antigen is going to bind to a B cell receptor. So in green here is our cell membrane of the B cell. And then these little antibody looking things are the B cell receptors. And by the way, they look like antibodies because they pretty much are antibodies. They just have an extra little section of them that allows them to be embedded into the cell membrane. So our naive B cell, it's gonna capture some of those antigens that it's sensitive to, and then it's going to undergo endocytosis, not phagocytosis, 
but endocytosis because it's a smaller, it's a little bit smaller scale. So while this endocytosis happens, it's going to break down the B cell receptor into little bits and pieces. It's also going to break down the antigens um, if it needs to. And then it's going to fuse that vesicle with another vesicle containing MHC class 2 protein. Why MHC class 2? Because this cell is, this, this B cell is a professional APC. So the end result is that antigens are going to be presented on the surface of the cell via MHC class 1. And it won't it will no longer be a naive B cell. It will now be a partially activated B cell. Partially activated B cell. It's not fully activated yet. So maybe an analogy here is like, it's kind of like turning the ignition on your car. Uh, you're partially activating it, but it's not, you're not pushing on the gas pedal yet. So it's not like really going. So our B cell is like ready to go, but not quite yet going. So if you'd like to maybe add a little detail into the worksheet, initially it, it's detecting the antigen and then it eventually gets that MHC class 2 protein displaying the antigen on the surface. And so we can call that step 11. All right, so for step 12, this is going to be, for the moment, unrelated to the B cell and more related to this dendritic cell that arrived in the lymph node. What we're going to have here is a T cell. Actually, the nucleus of a T cell is usually a little bit bigger, so let's draw a bigger nucleus. And it has some little receptors there. And the interaction between this T cell and the dendritic cell is going to make up step 12. All right, so let's zoom in on what's happening between this part of the dendritic cell and this T cell. And let's see what we name this step. So step 12 is called naive helper T cell, naive helper T cell or TH cell encounters a dendritic cell or a macrophage, whatever actually came into the lymph node, carrying an antigen it recognizes. So the helper T cell is recognizing the antigen that the dendritic cell here is carrying. And then the naive helper T cell is going to activate. So what does this look like more zoomed in? So here's the first, the kind of end of the dendritic cell. Here's their MHC class two with a little antigen being presented in the front. Here's our helper T cell. The T cell has a T cell receptor, TCR, which recognizes that one specific antigen. And it recognizes it when it's being held by another immune system cell. So through this interaction, the naive helper T cell becomes a fully activated helper T cell. 
which is going to be important for step 13. All right, so step 13 is our second to last step. So almost there. So let's draw our fully activated helper T cell. It's gonna look the same as before, but it's okay. <laughs> so that helper T cell started off naive and then because of the interaction in step 12, it got fully activated. Then it, this helper T cell is gonna find a partially activated B cell, like this one right here. So it goes there, and then this is what step 13 is gonna be. So an activated helper T cell binds to a partially activated B cell, which fully activates the B cell. So what it looks like zoomed in, here is our partially activated B cell, here is our fully activated helper T cell, and once they communicate with each other, then they start to release chemicals and those chemicals are gonna result in the full activation of this B cell. This step is vital to fight off many infections that need to be fought off. If this full activation of the B cell doesn't happen, then you might have the infection in your body and growing. And we'll see why, because in this last step 15, this last major step, um, is where all the magic kind of is happening with the cool things your immune system can do to fight off infection. And it needs to have step 13 happen most of the time. All right, so let's draw step 14, our last really major step. And then let's go into detail about what's going on. So after step 13, when the B cell gets fully activated through this interaction, then we're going to have a couple of things happen. Three things. So one of the things is that a new cell type is gonna be formed called a plasma cell. And those plasma cells are really good at releasing antibodies. Another cell type that's formed are cells that look pretty much exactly like these B cells. They're called memory B cells. So they're essentially little clones of that cell right there. They are going to grow in number, help you fight off infection later. And then we're also going to get the development of these cells, which are really similar to natural killer cells, but they're going to be the cytotoxic T cells. And these three things together will or can leave the lymph node through these efferent lymphatic vessels and then distribute throughout your body like to the rest of the lymphatic system, to your circulatory system, or end up in your interstitial fluid to fight off infection all over your body.
So let's call this step 14 here. So step 14, um, I like to call this step B-cell and T-cell cloning, followed by cellular differentiation, which creates armies of plasma cells, memory B-cells, and cytotoxic T-cells. So there's a lot of mitosis happening here, a lot of cell division of these cells. So these cells are essentially cloning themselves to create copies of themselves. And then once they have a bunch of copies of themselves, some of those undergo cellular differentiation to become plasma cells. Some of them will become memory B cells, like staying clones. They don't really undergo that differentiation much. Um, and then the clones of the helper T cells undergo cellular differentiation to turn into cytotoxic T cells. Now, there's so much mitosis happening here, so much cell division, that the cell numbers inside of the lymph nodes are increasing very rapidly. And that surge of cell numbers is going to result in the lymph node getting physically bigger, which causes the lymph nodes to swell. In your neck, we have lymph nodes that are pretty easy to feel when you're sick because they're on the surface a lot. Um, they're really superficial lymph, lymph nodes. So when you get sick in your throat and those lymph nodes are swollen up, that's why you can feel them is because of step 14 happening here. Lots of cells being made by your body. So let's talk about the plasma cells first. The plasma cells they're going to secrete antibodies that work in a couple different ways. First, antibodies can help neutralize pathogens. What they do, it, neutralization is essentially when uh, the antibodies surround a pathogen or the antibodies surround an antigen. And then by coding it, that pathogen or antigen can't do anything anymore. It's it's completely surrounded. It's like in a straitjacket, so it can't do anything. Antibodies could also cause agglutination, which is clumping the pathogens together, or it could clump the antigens together. So an antibody could help uh, bind a bunch of them together, clumping them into a big group, into a cluster. The benefit of this is that it makes it easier for your immune system to find them and kill them off. A third thing that antibodies can do is cause precipitation. So precipitation is when any antigens that are dissolved in the fluid of your body in water, they are going to come out of solution. So. This one can be a little bit confusing for people, I think. Um, the quick way of thinking about this is that for antigens to do any damage to your body, they have to dissolve in water in order to access your cells and your tissues of the body. <clears throat> if the antigens are not dissolved, if they're out of solution, then they're not gonna be able to cause any harm. So antibodies, once they bind to antigens, they can bring that antibody out of solution also known as precipitation, and thus they're not able to harm you anymore. The last thing that antibodies can do to help you is to activate the complement system. So here's a little antibody there. Um, this red phospholipid bilayer is the phospholipid bilayer of a bacterial cell. And once the antibody binds to the bacterial cell, it starts to recruit proteins like this one, 
called complement proteins. And the complement proteins, they insert themselves into the cell membrane of bacteria and they create a hole. And through this hole, things can leak out of the bacterial cell and essentially causes lysis of the bacteria. So step four kills the bacteria, whereas step one through three, sorry, not step, uh, I guess option four kills the bacteria through lysis. Um, steps, or <laughs> options one through three here don't straight away kill the pathogen, but they enhance phagocytosis um, by helping alert the macrophages like, hey, this pathogen is right here and the macrophage or the neutrophil will We'll see the antibodies and then phagocytize it or the clumps there. Once it's clumped together with the antibodies, the, the macrophages and neutrophils know where to go. They can phagocytize that. And same with the dissolved, or sorry, same with the precipitated antigens. Macrophages and neutrophils will find that and gobble that up. So... That's the lowdown on plasma cells. Memory B cells, they stick around after the first immune response to provide a more, a more rapid secondary immune response to the same antigen. So this is essentially the, the idea behind vaccination so that you know when you get vaccinated once for something that you then create some memory b cells from that vaccination so if you get a flu shot and then you were to get that same flu you already have the memory b cells for that infection so if you were to get the flu then it, you're gonna have a much more rapid immune response and you're gonna be sick for a lot less time if it comes around. So altogether, the plasma cells and the memory B cells, so both part of the B cell family, <clears throat> this makes up what's called our humoral immunity. Humor doesn't have to do with being funny in this case. Humoral means of the humor, which a humor is like the liquids of your body, the lymph of your body, the fluid in your lymphatic system, right? Uh, blood, the fluid, the blood plasma that's part of your circulatory system, or the fluid in your tissues, the interstitial fluid is part of your humors. <clears throat> The cytotoxic T cells are not part of this humoral immunity. Um, the cytotoxic T cells are going to scan and kill cells just like natural killer cells. Um, but this is going to be part of what's called your cell mediated immunity. All right, and then our very last step is happening back in the tissue site. So step 15, and this one's straightforward here. So step 15, macrophages in the infected site are gonna clear any remaining pathogens they're gonna remove cell debris from all that cell activity, and they're gonna help accelerate tissue repair where that nail went into your foot. So, um, hopefully, by going through all these little details here, you kinda of have a big picture idea of what would happen if you got uh, if you stepped on a dirty nail, uh, unsterilized nail, that nail contained bacteria that penetrated into the dermis, the bacteria was releasing endotoxins, 
and how your B cells respond to that, how your dendritic cells respond or your macrophages, what kinds of cells leave the blood, uh, the blood vessels, what the role of the mast cell here is, how, do, how does this whole uh, lymph node work, what interactions do the helper T cells do, what interactions um, does it do here, and what are the main cells that are a result of the interactions in step 13, and how do those antibodies help fight off the infection? So that's the big idea. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. All right, thanks.